1981, Norwood reported on four UCL repairs with two out of the four returning to the same level of play. And that was about all we had until 11 years later when John Conway reported on Frank Job's patients. He reported on 70 of them, including Tommy John himself. Uh, in that list, and this gets lost in history a little bit, there were 14 repairs uh, to bone and 56 reconstructions. And within those 14, seven of the 14 did well, but only two out of seven Major League Baseball players returned to the same level of play. So that's about a 29 or 30% success rate compared to the 75% that was seen with reconstructions. So subsequent to that, this technique of repair got kind of panned and, and lost to obscurity. It was another 15 years or so before Buddy Savoy published a series of articles in AJSM, first in female athletes and then in male overhead athletes, and so are male and female overhead athletes. So the 2008 article is interesting in that this was predominantly a group of overhead throwers. Uh, most of them, 51 of them, or 50-something of them were uh, used with suture anchors, and then nine of them were used, uh, used sutures through drill holes. But 93% good and excellent results, and 58 out of 60 returned to the same or higher level of play at si an average of six months postoperatively. And this included a number of Division I college baseball pitchers. This is an article that we, we haven't paid a lot of attention to, but maybe we should have. We're dealing with younger, more, uh, less trauma to the elbow when we're dealing with adolescent and high school and collegiate age kids a lot of times. So a lot of times these kids have end avulsions or partial thickness tears. Rarely in these kids, it's, it's more common to have that type of an injury, but rarely will you see an attritional rupture like we do with an older thrower where the tissue is deteriorated or destroyed from chronic repetitive overuse. So the question we asked is, is UCL reconstruction necessary and were we doing too much surgery for the various pathologies we were seeing from all ages? So we, we came up with a novel construct uh, with the help of our friends here at Arthrex using uh, two 3.5 millimeter uh, corkscrew peak anchors and a collagen coated fiber tape with a size zero super suture uh, through the eyelet of the first anchor. So just to track it, the, the suture, well, that didn't go well. <coughs> Excuse me, the suture, the suture tape is looped through the first anchor and then both limbs are placed through the uh, eyelet of the second anchor with the super suture on the eyelet of the first anchor. So we did a uh, cadaver study with 10 match pairs cadavers and we compared the UCL repair augmented with the, uh, with the uh, internal brace to traditional Tommy John surgery using a Palmaris longus tendon graft through drill tunnels. And what we came up with was that the gap formation was statistically better with the UCL repair with the tape. And that makes sense because this is a relatively rigid construct. There's not going to be a lot of strain on this with a valgus stress. But it was significantly different than the gap formation with what we typically do with Tommy John surgery at time zero. That wasn't surprising. What was a little bit surprised, so you can see here, this is the results that we got. So there was a uh, statistically significant difference uh, with a P level of 0 0.03 with the uh, gap formation with the uh, repair versus the reconstruction. Then we went on to compare the native ligament, the tear torn condition, and the repair condition to see how close we could get to the native condition. So the blue is the native, the red is the tear, and the green is the procedure. The left grouping is the reconstruction, and the right grouping is the repair. So what we saw was that we were able to more accurately and closely reproduce the time zero intact state with the repair and augmentation with internal brace versus the reconstruction. So again, the gap formation was greater with the reconstruction. So with the success that Buddy had in, in the mid-2000s in our basic science study, we looked at doing the first patient. This is him. This was the alpha patient. And we've done 127 in Birmingham through December 31st. And the first 40 with minimum one-year follow-up are what we're going to talk about next. So these 40 patients ranged in age from 13 to 33 with an average age just under age 18. So we're still talking about mostly high school age kids. Baseball made up the predominance of 75% of these kids with softball being a few, tennis, football, javelin, cheer, and rock climbing. And within the baseball group, 75% of those were pitchers. In the javelin group, we had all levels, high school, college, softball, we had two high schools and one college. In baseball, we had uh, 22 high school and eight collegiate pitchers. There were 19 proximal and 17 distal complete ruptures, I'm sorry, distal ruptures, with, uh, you can see the split there, with more of the complete ruptures being distal 
and more of the par partial ruptures being proximal. There were four mid-substance ruptures that we did this procedure for in non-throwers. Dominant arm was, uh, was the most with 38 out of 40, and the uh, average time from injury to repair was 7.3 months. Now, interestingly, that number went down in throwers and went down further in high school throwers. So in high school throwers, we were more likely to pull the trigger at an earlier time frame after injury. If you look at the published KJOC scores, uh, these are reported norms. Basically, the, the important numbers here are that professional pitchers average about 90.9, and if they have a history of an upper extremity injury or surgery, those numbers go down significantly. Now, these are people that are still playing. So a professional Major League Baseball pitcher that's had an elbow injury and had surgery, their KJOC score is not likely to return to the 90 level. So our results, looking at, uh, at the one-year follow-up, we had 85% follow-up at 12 months. Our KJOC score for the 34 patients we followed averaged 93. Baseball pitchers at 12 months averaged 94. And the throwing athletes rated their elbows at 95.6% of normal at 12 months post-op. 23 out of the 40 had ulnar nerve transpositions. Uh, one had had a previous ulnar nerve transposition. I will tell you that over the next 80 of these, that percentage has gone way down. We've done a lot less ulnar nerve transposition. The one-year KJOC scores are, you can see there, 92.2 with and 93.5 without. But in the throwing population, they actually did better with ulnar nerve transposition than without. There were no major complications. One patient had a little bit of heterotopic bone that we had to resect. He was eight months post-op and had lost some extension. Uh, so there were two reoperations in total. Uh, one was to remove a retained subcuticular stitch who returned to baseball about six or eight weeks after that. And one was the heterotopic bone excision. The poor outcome that we had was the 23-year-old female rock climber with an acute instability episode from a fall seven months prior to surgery. She had pain and ulnar nerve symptoms preoperatively with weakness and dysesthesias and changes on an EMG. She's stable on exam with a full range of motion and her MRI looks good, the ligament is intact. She has a full range of motion, but she continues to have ulnar nerve symptoms and still activity-wise cannot return to rock climbing uh, with continued weakness and dysesthesias. Patients achieved full range of motion by six to eight weeks post-op in all cases with the exception of the kid with the uh, heterotopic bone. Plyometric exercises are initiated after six weeks when range of motion is full. And the throwing program is initiated four weeks after four weeks of plyometrics, which averaged at about the beginning of week 11. So the return to play average for baseball averaged somewhere between 21 and 22 weeks, uh, which is just under six months. So to date, 39 out of 40 have returned to at least their pre-surgical level of sports participation, given the opportunity. The rock climber cannot climb due to the elbow. Uh, four went from high school to college during the first year. There were no statistically significant differences in the KJOC scores between proximal or distal or partial versus complete. So the, the procedure and the recovery seem to be standard across them. As far as levels of play, 13 out of the 14 high school pitchers with at least one year of high school baseball remaining returned to pitching. One, the one out of 14 that did not said he did not want to pitch anymore, but was playing shortstop with no complaints. Four went on to make a collegiate team and pitch at least one season and two out of the four high school pitchers who had completed their high school senior year went on to compete at the collegiate level, one pitcher and one infielder. The remaining two report no elbow issues and that their non-return was not elbow related. Keep in mind, this is just the first 40 that had one year follow-up. Five out of five collegiate pitchers returned to their pre-surgical level of play, two were fifth year seniors who were able to return rather than retire, and all high school and collegiate non-pitchers were able to return the gymnasts went back at five months, pole vaulting at four, javelin throwing at six, and football non-throwing at two and a half. Uh, recreational tennis player was back to the same level. Limitations are there's a limited number of patients and only one year follow-up. It's mostly high school and collegiate athletes. There have been three major league pitchers done, and I have to give credit to George Paletta. He did the first two. The first major league pitcher, uh, an NCAA pitcher, pitched two games. There's no control group to compare to. So, my thoughts with this is, as with all ligamentous injuries around the body, end avulsions of the UCL can be repaired back to bone, and partial thickness tears can be augmented. The addition of an ultra-strong biologic-enhanced tape and modern anchor technology may provide protection to the repair while healing and a backstop over time. I, I want to caution the audience that this is not a ligament replacement, and the, the tape should never be the primary restraint to valgus instability. It should be the backup. 
So I have cautious optimism in patients with partial thickness injuries and end avulsions. I'm not likely to use this technique in those who have attritional ruptures and poor quality tissue. They have a tissue deficiency and need more collagen. And as we move on to more and higher levels of sports, we're eager to see how the outcomes of this procedure continue to improve.